Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the channel. I am Minister Latasha. Just coming on here to encourage somebody on this beautiful day. Um, first, before I even get off into this message, let's go into a quick prayer. So, Father God, I just thank you for another day. I thank you for another opportunity to come on here and spread your good news to your people. Father God, I ask that you touch the hearts and minds of those watching to be open to receive that which you are giving them on today. Father God, I ask that you allow me to decrease and you increase. None of me and all of you, Holy Ghost, have your way in me and through me. I welcome you into this place, into my temple, into my life, Father God. And Lord, I ask that something major be released, that a shifting occurs through your message on today and lives will be changed in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, I cover myself in this video in the blood of Jesus, asking that you block every attack the enemy tries to send this way. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for everything that you've done, everything that you're doing, and everything that you're going to do. And it's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. So today, today I want to talk about stubbornness. Stubbornness, disobedience. And we're going to come from the book of Jonah. And um, I pray that this message bless somebody on today. And not only that it bless somebody, but that it teaches us how we need to be obedient in this season. Um, we don't need to allow the spirit of stubbornness or pride to prevent us from doing what God wants us to do in this season. So, like I said, I'm coming from the book of Jonah. And I just, I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to read and stop as I go. Um, so the book of Jonah chapter one, and it reads, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amadi, go to the great city of Nevada and pray against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarsh. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarsh to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. I'm going to stop right there for a second. So Jonah was given an assignment. And out of Jonah's own stubbornness, rebellion, and pride, he fled. He fled from the Lord. <laughs> it didn't even take a long after he fled for God to send a storm because of his disobedience. It did not take a long. For God to send that storm because of his disobedience. But Jonah had grown, I mean, sorry, but Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. For cast lights and the lights fell on Jonah. So, two things that I recognized in Dale's scriptures. One, he went to the bottom. He went below deck. That's exactly where you go. That's exactly what you hit is rock bottom. When you don't take heed to the instructions and the directions that God gives you to do. It's like telling God, I know better than you know. I know what's best for me than you do. And then, so God's like, God will let you have your free will. He'll let you do what you want to do. But then you have to come to, he'll, he'll take you through a, through a land, through wilderness, through lullaby, wherever you have to go, rock bottom to the bottom deck to allow you to look back up, have to look back up and to remember who he is. And then it said that he fell, he fell into a deep sleep. I think that was a, a, a spiritual thing. It wasn't just the fact that he was able to see, sleep through the storm, even though in, in the flesh, when it rains and it storms um, in our areas, that do be the best sleep ever. <laughs> 
But I don't think that that necessarily meant in the flesh. I believe that God saying spiritually he was asleep, meaning that he was closed, his vision was closed off to what was really going on. That he had, he had his discernment or was off to what was going on. Or his spiritual sight was off to what God was trying to show him in that moment. And then they said they cast lots trying to see who brought this storm upon them. Lots. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with lots, but it's like when you have the two the two picks and you put them in your hand and then everybody pull the two pick and whoever have the short one, that's who it, it, it comes on. Um, that's who it have to go or whatever. And then it says that the lots fell on Jonah. And isn't it just amazing how God can use a very foolish thing, something so foolish to call you out? Something so foolish to expose you. Something so foolish to expose or call out the enemy or who's at fault. So, it continued to read on. So, they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? Where did you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? <laughs> he answered, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord. The God of heaven who made the sea and the land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. So even now, let's back up. It said that when the storm started coming, they started, you know, praying to their own God. So they just let you know that they did not have a relationship with God themselves. But they knew of him. They knew of his power. They they knew of what he was capable of doing. So they knew that when if, if Jonah was the one that brought on this storm and that that's who he worshipped, then truly you had to do something to make the Lord send this storm, to send this wrath. What did you do? What did you do, fool? That's basically what they probably wanted to say. Fool, what you done did? <laughs> and so the sea was getting rougher. And rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Since you done brought this storm to us, what do we need to do to you to make the sea come off of us? What, what do we need to do? Why we got to suffer for what you did? Why we got to suffer for your disobedience? Why we got to suffer for your stubbornness? Why we got to suffer for your pride. What can we do to you to get this off of us? Because we don't want it. We didn't ask for this. You came to us. And that's what happens in life. God gives us instructions. He gives us um, assignments. You know, and we being stubborn beings or us being prideful or us just being rebellious, we do what we want to do because see, we don't understand when, even though we don't, we post to lean on God, we, we, we don't post to lean on our own understanding, but we post to trust God and we post to trust God simply because he knows all and he sees all and he has a greater plan for our lives. So how dare, how dare us not trust God telling us, I need you to go here or I need you to do this. How dare us say, no, nah, I ain't finna go there. I don't want to do that. I know what's right here. I'm going to handle this right here. Or I'm going to go this way and do that because that looks better for me or it feels better for me. When you go out of the will of God and you do what you want to do, especially when you know God have gave you clear instructions, clear directions, or a clear assignment or something to do, and you go against the grain, and you do what you want to do, it doesn't only affect you. It affects those that's attached to you. Those that are connected to you. Those that was waiting on you in that assignment that he gave to you to do. So now you're wondering why your children sick, why your finances cutting up, why your job getting harder? Why your body getting sick? Why why um folks over there looking at you crazy? Why things ain't lining up for you? Because it don't just affect you. Your assi the assignment that God gave you, the directions that God gave you, the instructions that God gave you does not only affect you. 
but it affects other people. That's why your purpose is bigger than you. That's why the assignment and the calling on your life is bigger than you. So how dare you say, well, this don't logically make sense to me. I mean, looking at the now, this seems like this is a better fit for me. So I'm going to do this. When God said, no, I want you to do this. God telling you to sow, sow into this ministry. But you saying, no, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the ministry I should sow in. I'm going to sow into this one. Because these people seem to be more preaching on prosperity. So I want a little bit more money. So I'm going to sow here. And it don't look like this church over here, this ministry over here, they, they preach on um, being obedient and being wise. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about what I'm doing wrong or what I need to correct about myself or what I need to acknowledge and how I need to allow God in to transform me. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to sow into that. I'm going to sow into these prosperity piece, preaching. And then you and your disobedience sowing into that not only affects you, but it affects your family, it affects your, your, you know, your circumstances, and then it affects the people over here where he asked you to sow them to. Verse 12, chapter 1. Pick me up and throw me in the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come, come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. <laughs> Two things that I got from that. One, Jonah took accountability. He took accountability for his actions. He knew that that storm came to them based off of his disobedience. He took accountability and he said, throw me into the sea. Because it is my fault I brought this to y'all. But the, the people, the people connected to him, they said, no, we don't want to throw him into the sea. We're going to see if we can roll through this storm and take it, go back to the land. Sometimes us as people, we so busy trying to save somebody. We so busy trying to help. Somebody that God done told us to take our hands off of. God has said, let me handle them. Can't nobody do it for them but me. Take your hands off. I don't need your help. I got this. I am God. But we always feel like we got the help. God need our help in some kind of way. We can help them. We can do this. And the storm grew rougher and rougher. Wider and wider. Why? Because. They was trying to save him when God had another plan for him because of his disobedience, his stubbornness, and his pride. I hope y'all catching some of this because I'm catching a lot. Okay, let's continue to read. Instead, the men did their best to roll back to the land, but they could not for the sea grew wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, Oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. The the after the men saw that no we can't help him we can't do this we can't we can't we can't roll through this um storm through these strong waves we gotta we gotta be obedient we gotta we gotta throw him off the boat but I don't want this blood on my hands I'm so scared that if I don't help this person or if I'm not there for this person or if I just stop praying for this person or if I stop giving money to this person or if I stop being this person's crutch. There's something going to happen to them, then it's going to be on me. Or they're going to hate me, then it's going to be on me. Or they may be homeless, and it's going to be on me. Or they may hurt themselves, and it's going to be on me. And God saying, no, it's not going to be on you. Because when I asked you to take your hands off of them, it automatically became on me. Because I am God. Not you, but me. I am God. And it's amazing how 
immediately how they when they threw them off, the storm became calm. Because in their obedience, it took the wrath off of them. Isn't it amazing how you go through a whole bunch of trauma in your life, a whole bunch of tests and trials and burdens and, and, and all kind of things go wrong in your life when you're doing what you want to do for somebody. You know those people-pleasing spirits when you feel like you got to be super saver. I got to help everybody when God ain't told you to help not one of them. But then you wonder why so much weight is on you. You wonder why the walk is so crucial, why the, why the walk is so heavy, why the journey is so hard, simply because you didn't throw them people over into the sea like God told you to do. You did not take your hands off of them like God told you to do. So since you want to continue to carry their burdens, then I'm going to let you carry their burdens, meaning all of it, all their storms, all they they trials, all their tribulations. You done, Now you done connected yourself locked hands with it and now you carrying it too but as soon as you let it go and do let it go throw them into the sea as instructed then now your now peace comes now you have peace now the storm is calm because it was never your storm to begin with mm. chapter two jonah's prayer from inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me up into the deep, into the very heart of the seas and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my, my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. Isn't it amazing how sometimes God has to allow you to hit rock bottom. He has to take you to the very bottom for you to remember who he is, to acknowledge who he is, and to look up to where your help come from. Jonah had a relationship with God. Jonah knew God. Jonah knew what God was capable of. Jonah knew that God can take, bring him out. But Jonah made the conscious decision. He willfully decided to be stubborn and disobedient, to be prideful and do what he wanted to do instead of what God had instructed him to do. He did that willfully. And so that's why he had to face the consequences of his choices and his decisions. But he also knew that even in the midst of him being at the bottom, that he knew who to cry out to. He knew who to pray to. He knew who would rescue him. And that's something else that we have to realize too. No matter what mistakes you make, God is a forgiving God. He's a graceful God. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. It's nothing that you have done or have done or can do or have did that is too shameful to go back to God and ask for forgiveness. And God not forgive you. He's gonna, he, he forgives us. You have to ask for forgiveness. But in asking for forgiveness, you also have to change. The same way you willfully made that wrong choice, you have to willfully make the decision to change for the better. Verse 7, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. I'm going to read that one again. That's Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah unto dry land. So in those three days and three nights, Jonah took accountability. He cried out to God. He made a vow to God. And because God 
heard his cry, heard, God heard his vow, and he accepted his accountability. He allowed the well, the big fish, to spit him out onto dry land. Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Here you go, the God of second chances. He gave you the opportunity to do the right thing the first time you did what you wanted to do. So you had to take another route, a detour. This path was a little bit more rockier than the path that would have been had you made the right decision and did what he told you to do the first time. But he, he's a God of second chances. And so here he go. Here he go. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. <laughs> go to the great city of Nevada. And proclaim to it the message I gave you. I give you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nevaeh. Now, Nevaeh was a very important city. A visit required three days. The number three. Jonah was in the belly of the big fish for three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. And then this city that he had to go to required three days. Let's continue to read. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed 40 more days and the veil will be overturned. The Nephites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nevaeh, he rose from his throne took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation from Nevaeh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So the king put them on a fast. <laughs> Don't eat nothing. Don't eat nothing. You go repent and we, we repent. We repenting and we fasting and we believe in God to have compassion on us. To have compassion on us. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. <laughs> Sometimes we need to go on fast. And I ain't going to say sometimes. Most of the times we need to go on fast. We need to go on fast is simply because it's removing distractions. It's also teaching us self-discipline, putting our flesh under, under control. And it also gives us time to hear. Because a lot of times in this busy society and world that we live in, we are not hearing properly. And the enemy, he's so trickery that he'll, he'll deceive us, having us thinking we, we, we hearing and we're not. <laughs> we hearing him or we hearing ourselves, but we're not hearing God. And then when God speaks, we 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 confuse, we doubting it that it's God, and we wanted to listen to what's soothing to our flesh. So that's why we need to fast so that we can be able to put our flesh under control and so that we can clearly hear. Jonah chapter four. <laughs> but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. See, God did not Jonah, let me tell you. Jonah did not want God to have compassion for them people. Jonah wanted them people to be punished for what they were doing. Jonah wanted his way. Do that sound like any of us? Do that sound like somebody? Jonah, we, we go to God and, and we be wanting things to go our way. We be wanting what we want. Even though we know that God has the best plan for our lives, he knows was ahead when we don't know at all. But yet and still, we want what we want. <laughs> we want our way, what we feel is best. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. And it continues. Let me reread that one again. Jonah chapter four. 
But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That this is why I was so quick to flee to Tarsh? I knew that you were you are a gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sin to calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. So you mean to tell me you so doggone stubborn and ignorant, so doggone prideful that you would rather die because you don't want to see somebody else bliss. You didn't want to see the manifestations that of, 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 of God's character because that's basically what he said. If you already knew that God was a gracious God, if you already knew that he was slow to anger, he was abounding, then... First of all, you you serving him, so you knew his character. So you're gonna get mad at him when he displays his character and he has and he has redeemed someone else. You oh you you don't want him to do that for nobody else. You don't you just want him to do it for you or for who you think should have it. You don't want him to forgive others. You just want him to forgive you or for who you feel like forgiveness should be or mercy or grace should be given to. Woo, that's some selfishness right there. Real selfish. You would rather die than to live. So you would rather die than to see somebody else have a second chance at life. You would rather die than to see somebody else bless. You would rather die than to see God deliver and transform and heal another another person. That's some that's some deep right there. But the Lord replied, "Have you any right to be angry?" <laughs> I, I kid y'all not. I think we. I think God got a sense of humor, and I do believe other people think God got a sense of humor too, because I know God probably was like, first of all, you claim to be one of mine. You know me. You should know me. You got a relationship with me. You know how I operate, and you mad because I do what I do. This is what I do, and you mad. Do you got a right to be angry? Did that not just get you out of the field? Did I not just, did I not just save you? But oh, 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 you wanted me to save you though. When you did, when, when you cried out and you prayed and you made a vow. But these people, they went on a fast and they cried out and they changed their ways and you don't want me to save them? Mm -hmm. Do you have a right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at the place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow over Jonah to give him shade over his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it would wither. Let me stop right there. Imagine sitting outside and you watching the manifestations of what God said he was going to do for somebody else. And it's hot. It's scorching hot. The sun beaming right on you. You sweating. And then God gives you shade. He gives you shelter. He allows a vine to grow a sprout out and to cover you, to give you shade, to keep you cool so that you can be comfortable. To show you that he got you covered. To show you that he's protecting you. To show you that he's your shelter. He's showing you his character up once again. And then you get happy because now you're not hot anymore. Now you're not sweating. You're not frustrated because he made me frustrated. So I'm pretty sure he was frustrated. But then, so God was showing him how good it feels when he shows up for not only you, but for people. But then the next day he sent a worm to take it, to eat it up, to show you what he can also do. <laughs> When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. <laughs> Not only did he send the worm to eat the vine, but he made the heat worse. <laughs> he made the heat worse. Oh my goodness. <laughs> God got a sense of humor. I don't care what nobody say. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live because that's just how hot it is out here. Lord. <laughs> But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? 
Meaning, you was angry about me sending compassion to these people. When I sent the vine, that was me sending compassion to you. So now that I take the vine away, do you got a right to be angry about that? He was proving a point. It's, he was proving a point. <laughs> he said, I do. <laughs> I am angry enough to die. Stubborn. Jonah was stubborn and prideful. He didn't even want to admit that he knew what God was showing. He knew God had made a valid point. He knew he was wrong. He knew the God he served. But he was so doggone prideful and stubborn. He I do. I still want to die. Just a fool. <laughs> Just a fool. Like many of us. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, I sprung, it sprung up overnight and died overnight. But Nevaeh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So God was saying to Jonah, you was concerned about a vine that only covered you. I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about people, multiple. Meaning that your purpose, your assignment, once again, I said this before, it's not about just you. What God wants you to do, what he instructs you to do, what he directs you to do, does not only concern you. It concerns other people. That's why they said your actions. You have to watch your actions because you don't know how your actions affect other people. You don't know how your actions affect other people. You don't know how your choices affect other people. You don't know how your decisions affect other people. You don't know how your disobedience affect other people. You don't know how your stubbornness affect other people. That's why you have to be obedient. When God gives you instructions, take heed to what he say and do it. And don't be slew-footed about doing it. Move quickly. Ask him. If he tells you something to do it and you don't understand, ask him to give you instructions and directions, whether he needs to give it to you in a dream, whether he needs to make it as, as clear as black and white. But ask him to tell you what to do next. You don't take it in your own will to do what you want to do or what you feel best do because it logically makes sense to you or it just looks right to you or it feels right to you because you're not God. You don't know what's ahead. He does. What feels good now may be hell later. He knows that. That's why he's taking you another route. That's why he's asking you to do something different. That's why he's telling you what to do and what not to do. But then when you make the conscious decision to do what you want to do as Jonah did, then now you got to face the consequences. Now you got to face the consequences. And unfortunately, your hell sometimes becomes other people's hell simply because you was obedient and they're connected to you. So now they got to be in the hell with you. So what I'm hoping that you got out of this message is a couple of things. In your prayer life, ask for deliverance. A stubborn spirit, the spirit of stubbornness, the spirit of pride, the spirit of rebelliousness. Ask God to give you a spiritual ear to hear. Get a strong relationship with God so that you know your daddy's voice. You know who you listen to. You know who to listen to. And, and be quick to move and to follow the directions and instructions that he gives you. If he reveals something to you, that's the best thing for you. It's no, it don't matter what you think. It don't matter what you feel. It don't matter what logically, logically makes sense to you. A lot of these things that's going on, it may make sense logically, but it's a spiritual thing. This, this is spirits we're dealing with. It. This is spirits. This is a spiritual walk. So how can you have a strong relationship with God? How can you worship God and not understand the spiritual aspect of what he's wanting for you? His purpose and calling for your life 
it ain't all about you. Unfortunately, it ain't all about me. If it was all about me, I promise you, being in ministry would be the last thing on my list because I never thought that I would be in ministry. I never thought that I would be spreading God good news to people or, or you know, tell, talking about his goodness and, 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 and just trying to live for him and just wanting to help people and just, you know, just wanting to be who he wants me to be. I never put myself in that category. But when God put that assignment on me and he gave me directions and instructions on what to do, I have to do it. I have to be obedient because it's not all, it's not all about Latasha. In my obedience, I may be saving someone's life. In my obedience, I may be helping someone get delivered. In my obedience, somebody is, is, is tasting and seeing that the Lord is good when they never tried them before. It ain't all about me. It ain't all about you. Yeah, you may be comfortable where you at and God may be trying to get you to do something different and then you still looking at where you at so you don't want to do the different. And then now, not only are you missing out on a great thing, but people that's connected to you are missing out on that great thing too. Out of your disobedience, out of your stubbornness, because you think you know everything. You want to control everything. That was one of my issues in your prayer time as God to deliver you from the spirit of control and the spirit of fear. Because fear and control will jack us up anytime, every time. You want to know why? Who are we to think we can control anything? We we not God. We can't, we, we, we over here trying to move the pieces. We over here playing checkers and God playing chess. He's saying, I am God. I don't need your help. I don't need you to help me. Let me help you. <laughs> but now we feel like we have to control every aspect of our life. When God already has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And that's why when we try to control something, it always get a little shaky. It always get a little rough. It always get delayed. It always seems like it's so much. It's like we're pushing it further and further away because we done put our hands in the midst and we done put checker pieces on the board and God over there playing chess. So now he got to say, okay, well, since you didn't want to do things my way, since you didn't want to take heed to my instructions, since you think you know best, I'm going to let you go your way. I'm going to let you go through that hell. I'm going to let you go through that forest. I'm going to let your feelings get hurt a couple of times. I'm going to let you go broke. I'm going to let you be stressed out and frustrated for a while since that's the way you wanted to go. And then you let me know when you're ready to go my way. <laughs> you let me know. I ain't going to force myself on you. I'm not a rapist. I am not going to force myself on you. I am a gentle God. I am a gentle man. When you are ready, knock and the door shall be answered. Ask and you shall receive. I am waiting on you. You're not waiting on me is what God is saying. So I pray that out of Jonah's story, you learn to be obedient, to drop stubbornness, to stop the drop pridefulness, to stop the drop rebelliousness, to drop control, because it's not all about you. And you don't know what your actions are. And who, who, your, who all is being affected by your actions, by your disobedience? If you guys have any prayer requests, my email address is listed in the description box below. Please send those prayer requests. Also, don't just send me prayer requests, y'all. Because Now, don't get it twisted. I love praying and interceding for people. I truly do. But I also like to hear the testimonies. Because God has blessed many of you watching. And I want to hear what he's done because that's what you're supposed to do. When God bless you, you're supposed to tell about his goodness because it gives other people hope. It lets them know that if he did it for them and I'm going through the very thing they're going through. And if he did it for them, surely he'll do it for me. So give your testimonies. You can email me your testimonies. I read them out to other people. I let people know what God did for you. Also, if you would like to sow into this message or if you would like to sow into this ministry, ways to sow is listed in the description box below as well. This is good ground. Every seed that's been sown, I thank you all for trusting the God in me. 
I know that God is going to bless your finances and, and, and multiply it a thousand times fold and not only bless your finances because that's not my prayer when you sow into this ministry, but I be praying that God bless every area of your life in a, in a miraculous way that he moved mightily in your, because you was obedient. That he moves mightily in every area of your life. That he shows up and that he shows out. And that he allows you to see his hands in the midst of every circumstance, every situation that you face. And that you trust and know that whatever it is that you're going through, he's turning it around for you. I pray this message has blessed many. And as I say on all my videos, you guys be blessed and a blessing.